Who and good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Pink Tron. I am Brent Robinson, and I am joined today by Nate Holm. Nate, what are you drinking? Uh, nothing right now. Oh, <laughs> it's it's early. It's three o'clock. Yeah, yeah. I we, we we James Bailey has already been harassing us about how far downhill the first um segment of the podcast has gone because it's yep. so many daytime people on the podcast now. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Steve Pritchard is also with us. Steve, what are you drinking? Well, it's always after 12 p.m. somewhere, so I'm on the uh, G-Bell beer cut with peach um, from the fridge. Tasty, tasty. And I have what's called a Steez Antioxidant Organic Green Tea with raspberry flavor. I don't know. I tried to find a mushroom drink, but I could not find one in town. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go, go for a Brent bit of Foley here. I don't know if that will work or not. Um, I, don't, I, I think about three people heard it when we, you tried it. You should do like actual fully, like. <laughs> 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 that was the sound you all were supposed to have heard was Steve cracking his beer. And speaking of cracking on, HSRL is up to week one. Over again, we are starting fresh with a new HSRL series. Race one is the classic Bologna ITT. <laughs> Um. Yeah, always, it's kind of fun. Oh, what do you got? Always Nate? a fa- always a favorite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of fun. So I guess we should start with saying this is a different um format for HSRL for the next uh six weeks, including this week. So there's going to be some different types of racing going on. Um, so that's kind of fun to mix it all up. Um, but yeah, so this week is like kind of the prologue ITT on Bologna. So we will be using the, uh, ITT modules. So you won't be like mass starting. It'll be off the treadmill and seeing people. So you have to track like where people are in front of you or behind you a little bit as best you can. They're 15 second intervals. So that's always, I don't know what I'm doing. ITTs. I always try and like kind of assume like if somebody I come out of the pen and they're like 31 28 seconds they were the 30 second in front of me guy if they're at 43 44 seconds they were the 45 second guy etc etc and try and gauge off that in terms of if I'm catching or losing um yes Zwift uh clock is still uh never exact it always uh kind of keeps jumping and changing yeah I find on Bologna it's not too bad but you know it's not perfect either so don't don't i mean still got to put your best effort in regardless you're definitely and the other thing is of course what i find is until you get late in the race like early in the race there's kind of people from all the different categories all around you up and down the list and so you can't um you can't always see where everyone who in your category is and how far up or behind they are that's that's the bit that's always confused me that it's 15 second intervals, but it's an A, B, C, and D at each 15 second interval. So there'll be people flying out of the pen much yeah. faster than me. Um, but yeah, then you start to see folks around you then. You see. Yep. And for the uninitiated, in terms of if you're not familiar with the Bologna course, it is six kilometers. We always describe six kilometers flat, but it's really more like six kilometers rolling. Like, yeah, there is some kind of uppy downy bits to it. Especially within like two kilometers of the climb, there's definitely some rolling there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then, and then it's two kilometers of very, very steep. Uh, like, I don't know, off the top of my head, I want to say nine to twelve percent. I think on that climb. Yeah, there's the uh, monster hill as you kind of come through the archway and do that like switch back. It's I think it's about seventeen percent there. Yeah, that's true. That that first right after you kind of pass the one kilometer, the, the seven kilometer mark total, the one the first half of that hill, there's a really really steep bit there. True story. Yep. So and they they they, they actually uh, went up that hill twice in uh, the Tour de France this year. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I've been waiting for us to ride Bologna to to chat about this with you, face. I hadn't realized that hill's like almost in the middle of the countryside, isn't it? And so you see the helicopter shot. Like it's it's up a, a hill and there's just green everywhere. Like I hadn't I completely hadn't realized that um until I saw the tour this year. I, I thought it was like in the middle of a city or something. So crazy. That 
And that was the ITT, the stage, uh, what, what was it, stage seven ITT? No, no, it was like... Uh, it was part of a race. It was like the second or third uh, race that they went to Bologna and they did uh, t- a circuit round Bologna twice and they went up that hill twice. And then it was like a, a descent and then thing. I think uh, Teddy, second time around, went up in about five minutes up that hill or something like that. It was like something unbelievable. I think it was like five minutes 20 to cover like 2K of uh, climbing. That On that <laughs> hill, that is unreal. That's got to be like a 6.0-ish, probably. Maybe a little higher than that. I'll try and find the exact stats, but it, it was uh, scary how fast he went up. If you're going that fast, you will win HSRL this week. <laughs> um, I've popped a link in the chat, and we'll try and pop this on the show notes uh, for an image of that climb. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, the San Luca Ascent. If you Google it, look at the images. Um, it's surprisingly, like, it's, it's a green around it. It just I, that blew my mind. I had no idea that was uh, what that climb was going to look like based off Swift. The second stage was Bologna, so I can find this travel link in a second for that. But um, I think it was quite interesting that it's, it's not quite the same circuit like they came on there was like another archway that they came on onto that hill so they can have a straight hill instead of doing that on swift you kind of do that almost switch back at the start and then go up the hill they just were coming through an archway from the other side of the town <laughs> but um they, 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 had, they had draft enables as well which um clearly makes it easier than this itt yeah, so, I I don't. I mean, the things deleted. I don't think it makes a damn like a difference on that hill. <laughs> I guess at five minutes for two k. I guess he's doing like I'm trying to work that out. Thirty, uh, twelve, twenty, eight, twenty-four kilometers an hour. Is that about right? I think the rest of us, mere humans, are more like fifteen or sixteen kilometers an hour. <laughs> So I guess there might be a little bit of draft. I mean, obviously the difference is he got to draft the however many 60, 80, 100 kilometers before they got there, but so he did. Do. I mean, it's slightly we on Zwift it says it's like 2.06. Um the actual climb in real life is 1.84. And he did it in five minutes and six se- seconds going twenty one point seven kilometers an hour. That's radical. <laughs> So it's like 1.84 kilometers in five minutes and six seconds. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it used to be, I think it was the C threshold, maybe the DC threshold, was if you could do Bologna in sub 20 minutes, right? Um, And and 10 minutes in place and 10 minutes up was the rule. And they're doing it in half that. It's just crazy. Yeah, I think I've done in eight minutes on the climb, maybe. I mean, I just, on that, it's so, like, uh, what, just da- a downer that you see your speed drop to, like, eight kilometers an hour, if that, and you're just, like, going, like, slow motion, yeah, and, then, and then, and then, and it, and then you get the A-rider who's, like, flying up, and just, you see him, and then he's gone, so even that, I mean, I couldn't imagine, like, riding that, like, pros and seeing them just, like, take off and in, into the distance in, in seconds. Yeah, that, so, that is that that is the that is the KOM on Strava right now. He broke he broke the record on his attack on stage two this year. So the current KOM in real life is five oh six. That's not even surprising. And, and Remco Remco yeah. Remco went up in five seventeen. So I mean Rem Remco was the second best time and still was like eleven seconds behind him. That is mad. We talked tactics to death on this one, haven't we? Like it's it's a classic over under, um, or, or under over in this case. Uh bike choice is the one I can ever remember. Is this TT bike? It's not really a bike swap course because I don't think you save enough time. But yeah, I think for sure A Bs and C's are TT bike. You might think about taking like one of the lighter TT bikes, like the felt IA or the Scott Plasma with like the 808s instead of like the 858s or the DT62s instead of the DT1100 discs just to save a bit of weight. But you're only going to be, you're talking fractions of a second probably either way. Um, I think there's an argument for maybe Ds to maybe go down to a Tron or something like that because they're not going to get as much out of the arrow. But 
Yeah. Um, I mean, it's still such a sh- it's still still short such a short climb. I mean, it really is. Depending on how fast you're bike swapping, and and do you actually get those seconds back or not? Or, I mean, you're you're maybe gaining ten seconds. Uh, you'd you'd have to do an awful fast bike swap. But I mean, I mean, average bike swap is like fifteen twenty seconds, and it's and then it's like, are you going to gain that much advantage after that? You may think you are, but again, I don't think on such a short climb like that you really are hampered by it yeah and, an and, and, you, and you lose so much momentum at the start just going around that corner i mean you probably because the steepness of that slope i mean you probably lose another 10 20 seconds there just because you got to go from a dead start again that's also <laughs> probably true I, I mean i know it like sounds a bit funny but like it's a game this race is an itt get your goofy looking helmet out it's not quite as goofy as the Tour de France guys, and uh, get a TT bike and pretend you're in a real ITT. Like, I don't know. enjoy it, enjoy it. Yeah, that's what that's what I always like to do when it's an ITT, regardless. And see if you can get the uh, what you call it, your uh, hundred kilometers on the downhill. Yeah, try and get your hundred kph on the downhill. That's a good one. Take a little breath on, at the top. It's on the TT bike. You can. I mean, it's that extra weight for sure. Can. Uh, can get you flying yeah if you give it one little gas i guess the other advantage of course is you stay as arrow as you're on the tt bike even when you're pedaling right to get to that 100 kph like it's not like on every other bike you gotta stop pedaling to get to your full arrow on the yeah um, i mean there's no way, there's duck. no there's no super duck on your tt enemy so you just gotta go and kill it that top half where it's the steepest exactly good and so come on out rage srl and try something different <laughs> uh all right that will bring us to Herd Beginner Racing. Nate, what do we got going on this week? Herd Beginner. I'm seeing. I don't know what. I'm going to grab yeah, up companion. Electric... The spreadsheet we normally check uh, is not as up to date. <laughs> yeah, if you go to the next tab, it shows electric loop, I think. Does that sound right? Yeah, we got electric loop. Um, so it looks like it's set up as two laps for uh, DEs and for CD, etc. It's at three laps. Um, so it's an 8.9 kilometer lap, uh, making the total distance around 18 to 27 k. It's pretty flat, um, this one. Um, it's uh, trying to remember where it's in. It's in one of the Mercury, uh, one of the Neoku. Uh, no, it's Mercury, isn't it? Lo- I, um, I loops. Neoku. Uh, it, yeah, it's in Neoku. So you go down, uh, start the start pens, down through the alley sprint, uh, wiggle around back, back through the tower sprint, um, and repeat. Uh, that's about it, really. Um, I think you probably turn around pretty close to the hairpin. That looks at the the promised land of Mount Fuji that, that hasn't been delivered yet. So, <laughs> so yeah, flat course, slippiest bike. Don't get dropped in the draft. I don't think there's any. I think what's cool about this one is there isn't really any aren't, aren't really any moments where there's even a kind of pay attention and you might get dropped, um, like we talked about some weeks. So yeah, um, check out Nate Tractors. Uh, Post on the Facebook page, always full of loads of information. Um, what does that take us to next, Brent? I just uh, want to double check if there, because I, I know he was not setting up because of the Zwift. There might only be one distance, because I know with the Zwift racing stuff, he was trying to limit the distances because they didn't know for sure where all the stuff was going to play out. So it may just be, even if you're in the bottom end of that group, you may still be doing. Um, Three laps. So just uh, so, it says it says on companions zero to two hundred two laps and the rest is three. Oh, okay. There you go. There's the cutoff. If you're under two hundred, two laps. There yep. we go. Okay. And it's you to find that you got to go into like it's not in the club anymore. You got to go to like the specific event or something because it's now in go, that. You have to go to the Zwift, Zwift Labs uh, club page. Yep. Okay. 
Good. All yeah. right. That will bring us to Clemmer's Gambit, where we are in week two of the, I don't remember what Chris called it, but the Hilltop Repeats series. Yeah. Or Rooftop Repeats series. Uh, which is, so we're going to be doing Rooftop Rendezvous again, and it's this time your fastest uh, two two trips up rooftop combined time. Yeah, that's it's, your... it's the summer rendezvous, two times up um, <clears throat> and those two times summed together is what's going to count um, for your time in the end of it. Yeah. Um, so next week is where we get to the slowest time of the three or four counting, which uh, yeah, it's going to lead to some interesting tactics. So Still think it's the Tron on this one. Um, I think it's, well, yeah. I think, I think A's and B's can go full TT. Oh, really? Yep. I think they're over 30 kph for the A's and B's. So, um, but yeah, and there's not as much strategy. Just go as hard as you can. I think pretty much both times. Maybe not quite 100% the first time up. Maybe 95% of what you think you can do. Rooftops like three and a half minutes, five minutes. Yeah, I mean three to five minutes, depending on cat. Maybe yeah. six, 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 six ish for D's. Yeah. So you know, pick pick that time and tr try and go about that effort, and then the second dive, just go as hard as you can until you die or you finish. <laughs> All right. Um, good. Kudos, everyone doing that one. You're going to see a lot of rooftop over the next few weeks. Um, heard of mountain goats. Steve's favorite mystery, Steve. as always. <laughs> oh, it's oh hell no. Oh, two laps. Uh, Steve two loves laps. the top. Oh my two God. laps. Oh hell no. Steve loves the top of the grade. Oh, uh, just I've done it. I think, <laughs> I think it's four times in about eight days. <laughs> um, it's not bad. So, I mean, I, I think there's not really much tactics to this, right? Just it's there's just go whatever you think your grade base is. Just try and find that twice. <laughs> well, so we did this for the um, the final exam in uh, Chris's previous series, didn't we? Um, mm -hmm. And Steph and I went on different routes. He went all out first lap and then just did what he could second lap. And I went for um, about 10% below FTP twice. Um, so I just went for just over 200 watts and Steph beat me by a minute. So, yeah, I think there's something to be said that maybe I should have gone for 95% times two. But, yeah, it was um, interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I just don't think, like, there's not going to be any draft on this once you get, for sure, once you hit the top half. But I don't think there's any, like, merit to trying to push out of your zone or anything to hold a group. I mean, you're going to get, if you're struggling to hold the group, even before you get to the midpoint of the first grade, you're going to get dropped. So find your pace, find your pace. Your fastest, closest time to the end is going to be whatever your fastest time to those two climbs is going to be, regardless of where the other riders are. Essentially, I've right. still got to do. I've still got to do the whole grade. Yeah, I've done that top part so many times, all the new routes, but I still haven't gone with the the full on a grade attempt. So, yeah, I haven't I, done one yet either. I might have to give it a go this weekend. The bottom part's actually quite nice. Um, I quite like the sort of like steady straight line climb. The top half, I just, I mean. I didn't mind the top half when I did it uh, for the final exam uh, in the Climbers Gambit series because I, I don't know why. I, I, I didn't mind it then so much. But the two times I've done Snowman now where you come out of the Mayan Com, the Itacom, and then to that, you've probably done about, I'm trying to think now, it is, it's about an eight, nine-minute climb and about a five, six-minute climb, if memory serves. So you've done about 15 minutes of effort and then you go into the top half of the grade and that's that's broken me physically and mentally both times, to be honest. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's, one of the hardest parts I find is the, um, is like a, the, the little like sidebar segment piece. Each one of those is, I want to say like 357 meters or something like that. 
Yeah. But of course it keeps getting steeper. So each one gets a little bit slower and it just kills your brain. Like <laughs> it's like I'm going harder, but it's like five seconds slower. <laughs> that, 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 that top, that top, uh, last couple switchbacks are really steep. Oh yeah. It, it, it really, it really gets like steep, like halfway up that. Cause in a second part and you're like, you're like, do, do I, do my legs have anything here or am I just going to completely crumble? So yeah, enjoy that mountain goats. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, have fun. Do um, we is the stampede? Stampede's huh? back. Stampede's yeah. back this week. We are going to have, uh, I think I pasted. Yeah, it's in there. Oh, it's going to be one lap of champs Elysees. So the new stampede series is going to be what we're calling the stampede world tour. So this week we are visiting France in order of the tour to France. And the route is going to be one lap of champs Elysees. So uh, bring your TT bike. The way that it works from the start for that direction is um, you it's go right. It's going to be out the right, turn right out the pens, down yeah. around the Jardin Tuileries tunnel, up the Champs Elysees to the Arc de Triomphe, turn around and back. So is the finish? Is it going to be a lap and a half? Yep. What's yeah. the lead? In? Yep. Yeah, it's like a three kilometer lead in. So yeah, you yeah you you go right underneath the. Yeah, so it's only once up the climb, basically. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It'll be a fun little. You can imagine you're in the the Tour de France this year as a TT finish, but not in Paris because of the Olympics. So, um, you can imagine you're doing what they ought to have done at the finish in Paris, <laughs> getting the finish in. Um, yeah, so week one, just be patient maybe with results because uh, WTRL is on holidays. <laughs> so <laughs> might be a week or two before we get the results all sorted. Um, but it looks quite nice series. I mean, not, week two seems the longest at 20K. Yeah, nothing, anything, too, nothing too crazy. The ones that are longer are flatter. Like that Coastal Crown, I think will be really interesting. So we're going to do, yeah, the second week is Coastal Crown, which will go up through pizza and Mayan that'll be the hard part but you finish on the downhill and then flat into the finish so that's kind of a fun TT finish thing um I've got we're gonna do laps of Glasgow reverse for 10k so we're gonna nice go, um backwards up the Clive kicker for a bunch of laps which will be kind of fun I, um, I've never done I've never done reverse yet so I'll be interested to me neither well and funnily enough I did that park We'll talk a little bit about Jason Hill, but I did park perimeter this morning, and that was the first time I did park perimeter reverse. I got a root badge for that one. So that's been one of the part of chasing. I'm getting a bunch of root badges. Um, there's a dust in the wind, and it's so dust in the wind is like a I think a super long loop, but the 12k is basically just straight out of the desert pens and then up and over Titans to the bottom. That's it. That's our USA route. Island Hopper is our Southeast Asia route. That's one lap of that. It's pretty flat. I think you do Shisa. Tempest, we're going to go down to 10K. That is our Australia route. Australian nice. Outback, that's what we're calling Tempest Fugit. And then, <laughs> and then ending um, Bologna 8K. That'll be our Italy route at the end. Um, yeah. So. Nice. Should be, I think, you, you know, nothing too punishing. Something you could be able to jump into and do another race that day most weeks. So. Yeah. Good deal. And I think that's it, I think. Bullseye remains on hiatus, particularly some of the some of the upcoming HSRL ones are going to have first across the line points in them. So we're kind of pulling a bit of the bullseye spirit into HSRL for the upcoming weeks. So bu bullseye is just on hold right now. Yep. Yep. I look forward to the confusion in those HSRL weeks where certain people charge off the front <laughs> to the confusion of other riders. As opposed to when they do that every other week right now. <laughs> 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 there, yeah, there's some scratch in the HSRL. There's some uh, first across the line points. There's a bunch of different ones. So, yeah, you have to, have to pay attention to what the series description is to see what the points are going to be for each week. So, like, or listen 15, to the thing drawn. 15% of the field to that, 20%. Nice. It's, it's not that. It, it's about 50%. Yeah, there's, I think it's 50% at the start and like 25% more pick it up as the route goes along when they realize what's going on after like the yeah. first sprint segment or something like that. And then, 
yeah like so, some some people st- some people still don't care but it's funny actually seeing it like you see it when multiple apps like again people have like the slowest like sprint time lap one and then lap two though like they've been bombing it yeah well it, it's always funny when someone posts in the chat too like why are you guys attacking the sprint <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> fastest time through for points man <laughs> Yeah. Read, the, read the race description <laughs> all right that brings us to round the horn and we think we're just going to talk about because i think none of us have really been doing herd racing series we've all been doing other things and punishing ourselves in other ways so we'll just talk maybe a bit about what's been going on there nate you've been doing some chasing some uh but a lot of the zwift racing stuff to work on zwift racing score how's that been going for you yeah, I tried out the racing score a little bit, like the Viva de France. Um, still hurts. I mean, I got I got bumped up to uh, C, so I thought, you know what, let's see what racing score is. If it's just as crazy as C, or or worse, and it was actually worse because in the three seventy five to four fifty range, there is a lot of uh, Bs in there still. So, uh, and on these shorter kind of Viva de France routes, they just push the pace and. Uh, makes it very interesting but you know i mean it's it's interesting you know i think the racing score is gonna t- it's gonna take its time it's um they're gonna fine tune it for sure but um i think he definitely i mean i've only done i think two or three under the racing score um and i've seen a little bit increase in my mine but again it's also part of that i think they've tweaked stuff behind the scene with like the uh the seed score as well and how that's worked out so because i know like a lot of people just on zwift riders with racers have been commenting about their seed score just jumping overnight and i think they're just there's small tweaks behind behind the scenes so yeah what well, uh and you're, do you think, do you find this like whatever the category of C under racing score, like it's harder or like fairer than on like sort of the old categorization? Or do you have an I think, impression of that? I think it's harder. I really yeah. think that um, right now, I, pro- I mean, it's just as hard as C. I mean, again, it's, so it's not really. You do have the higher C's up there, but then you've got like the lower B's in there that can kind of um, push the pace on the flat of it. So I don't know. I think it's I always. Think... I mean, I was talking about the bit before when we're waiting on Steve uh, finishing doing his stuff. Um, raw watts are not everything. I don't think on Zwift. I mean, I think li- lighter riders for sure. I mean, I I know there's guys that I race with, and they can beat me pretty good in races, but um, they got much uh, lower seed score because of their light, light, lighter weight, so <laughs> and lower kind of raw watt, so it's, it's interesting to kind of see Yeah, I found that, I think with the re- recategorization of C, that group's got a bit harder anyway, but it used to be you'd sit at probably 2.2 in a in a nice pack or two, even with people pushing at the front, and I found now people are pushing on the front, it's enough to bump that up to kind of two seven two eight, and that just becomes a bit more like the the yellow whatever that one is, so more tempo. Um, so I find it like where I am in the seas at the moment, a bit lower down, it's it's harder to get that kind of rest point back. You're always on on a bit of an effort, um, which makes the racing a bit more spicy, but. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, haven't, I haven't tried any of the um, uh, Zip Racing ones. Might check one of those out over the weekend. Yeah. Is that yeah. about to top races, I think. Yeah, they're, they're, in Zwift, they're in Zwift Labs. Those like Vive La France ones that are independent. And I think uh, Tiny Races are Tiny Races there right now as well, using the Zwift score. And uh, so is some of the crit races, I believe. Yeah, the the feedback from some of the Mustangs guys that I race at RL and and bladder stuff with was a bit that um, it felt like we were getting pushed in with lower A's and stuff. That the top B guys were gonna find it hard. So, 
I don't know. Maybe everyone just complains everything gets harder. I guess I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I guess, again, so. you know, you don't only one person could win a race. It's it's. So, I mean, it's so it's always going to be challenging in the first part, but you just want a pack that feels as though it's uh, you can kind of stay with. I mean, I think um, the like my racing score was when I even when I was at D was still in that zone just, and then I got bumped up and slightly improved, but there was like higher Ds in that zone and they, they, they got blown out almost straight away. So it's like, I don't know what fun is that? If you kind of throwing high D's in with like low, low B's and they're just getting blown out within 10 minutes of a race. Yeah. There's something missing in the categorization that's happening. I mean, it's, I mean, race racing should be hard, but it shouldn't be full gas, full on attack mode. And just, uh, hoping to survive like uh hard winter racing. I mean, hard winter racing, you expect that. I think with the normal categorization, you would expect hard push, but not when am I going to get dropped? Well, and even if it's like, if someone goes like that out the pen, if they're in the right category with the people who can't hold that, they should come back. Like the, they should cook it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So. All right. Well, uh, I think the reason that, Steve and I have not been doing, or at least one of the reasons we're doing no Zwift racing is we've been doing Chasing Yellow, which does not use the Zwift racing score. Um, and that's been an experience, I got to say. I, how's it going for you, Steve? <laughs> I After don't, your TSS hit about, what, 1,100? <laughs> I, I did 1,300 last week. Um, so I didn't do... I think did other races but, um, over the weekend and then did four of the chasing yellow stages during the week and a uh, ladder league race. And then this week I had the Monday, I did take a rest day. I did two chasing stages and then I did a ladder race last night and I'm just, just cooked. <coughs> uh, I didn't ride today. I had no, no appetite to ride today. Um, uh, it's interesting. So my, my 20 minute uh, FTP is what? 3.0, 3.1, something like that at the moment. And that's, no, Dreamland game <laughs> that's at the moment. I can pushing for two is hard. Um, so yeah, just a, a lot of fatigue. But it's interesting. It comes back to categorization. I think it's if you're doing it every week uh, or every day, with you, you get to kind of know the people you should be racing, which is good. But I think the the holes are in the categorization. I think Nate, you jumped into one and kind of that like, you're nowhere near anyone. And you're, like, you're not really sure who you're racing because there's people who are D. Some of the guys I was trying to keep up with who are listed as Ds are actually Bs in Zwift. Um, so you're just thinking, well, you guys can do so much more on the flat than I can. Um, so, yeah. it's. Um, but they managed to get into the D cat under the Zwift racing stuff? Because yeah, the categorization know. is off your Zwift racing category. And there's a whole, I can't remember, there's a whole thing you got to figure out. The, th the thing is, though, the race pass with that, people can enter whatever they want. So, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's people that are classified as like lower down where they should be. I mean, it gets, it gets, because it's a mass start, Chase and Yell doesn't really care wh what pen you enter because it automatically gets sorted. So, um, oh, I see. You can enter whatever pen, but then they sort you afterwards. Yeah. So, people are probably, um... people are probably doing it for the Zwift power point of view or whatever to think, oh, they want a race or, um there's okay. also again this if you've been off swift for a while and you didn't have an you had a low 90 velo it was like your velo as as the chasing tour started so like i laugh like there's somebody in d's right now that's just cleaning up because like they're like a medium b and their velo score was just below the category and then now they're like way up into the next category yeah, I'd love to know. So I'm just going to go and find some of the um, the person I've got in mind actually from the results who who has turned up to a bunch of races and there. I don't even know what metal category they are because there's so many metals above gold. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the names are. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a mixed uh, bunch. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I I jumped in and I. I enjoyed it, but at the same time, it's it's the mass start really isn't needed. I think you you would get enough fun with with the non mass start because again, 
your e-racers are just basically getting blown out straight away and then they're like in a small pack but they're they're working so hard at the start and those that can't work that hard get dropped instantly and then because they're doing these longer stages i mean people don't i think people who do Zwift for to Zwift the events at times don't forget about like the the lower cats and if you you're like an e-racer that wants to enjoy this doesn't care about the time i'm sure there's a lot of people that are doing it solo because again they just cannot hang at the start these pushes at the start are not huge because it's a three week race but they're still big enough that if you're a two watt per kilo rider it's pretty hard to hold on i'll tell you the one that started country coastal was full gas if there was yeah if there was no d's holding on to that group <laughs> no no offense d's but like i dropped no, no. i dropped the a's and and for top three b's and then that barely caught the second group of b's like they actually kind of pulled through me and i but had to like give her to catch on to him before he hit the downhill. So, and we were all B's and maybe one or two C's. But, it, but I mean, for a three week race, it kind of, from like my one race I saw, it's like mass start just doesn't justify it because again, it's like, yeah, you have somebody that's at the top of the cat who can jump onto that and stay with them over there. Then they're just miles ahead of everyone else because the, the way the draft works. Like, and then everyone else. We've, we've, I've seen some people now at the Wednesday. Um, people are like, we're just not going to race this. Like, we're getting around. We're forming up a group. We're doing this pace. Like, let's just go around, um, which is quite cool. And we, we were chatting last week about how I think they've, if the objective is to simulate the Tour de France, the mass start in a way does, but it simulates the Grappetto for the likes of me and you, Nate, falling <laughs> very quickly. Um, yeah. So the bits where the bits where the riders race are not like, and the bits where the best A's race are not the bits where the D's and some C's and the E's are racing because you you get blown out at the start and then it becomes just a bit of an ITT for some people, which is there's a lot of time spent riding on your own. I mean, I guess if you pick a daytime slot and you put the Tour de France stage on. You've got something to watch at least, but it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. But it bloody how it's tough. Like kudos to people who are doing it every day. I've done all thirteen so far. Yeah. I di- I didn't race it. I didn't do anything on the Monday. That was the rest day. I was off. But otherwise, I've done them all. I had this. I had. I've been doing a bunch of them, especially during the week at the six a.m. slot. But on Thursday, I had to sleep in. I just <laughs> could not. Like on um, I, I put it in the chat for the pink trauma but i think it was on the wednesday morning um i had like some problems with my gearing right in the middle of like the mine and itza climbs and just like like just got like just momentarily like disrupted my rhythm couldn't get on the power fell off the back of the group and if i could have just like probably surged back on for like 30 seconds to a minute i probably could have got there but by at 6 25 in the morning or whatever time it was I had no give a poop to to do that. I was like, nope, I'm just going to let you guys go and I'm going to catch the second group. That's fine. Yep. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's um, it's it's interesting. I, I I don't know. I don't know that I like it that much because you do have to do a little bit of the pacing of stuff for racing like over days, but and definitely at the end, like when you hit the end of a long stage, like we did that one yesterday and it was not too much craziness, but when we hit the, the final climb and you're like, you have, haven't been working that hard, but it's obvious the other guys are a little fitter than you and they just smash it and you're like, oh, how are you doing this right now after an hour on this bike after 12 of these and they're dropping, you know, 5.5, 6 watts in the final climb. You're like... I don't have one more of those today. <laughs> so tomorrow is going to be unpleasant, extraordinarily. Or is it tomorrow? Octobon. Lovely. Full Octobon. Yeah, there's the out of the last eight routes, there's an Octobon and there's a Quatch Quest, which are wow. going to both be ugly. I think Steve's coming out of retirement just to do Oct- Octobon tomorrow. So I'm, thankfully, it's sunny and I'm going to be playing cricket. 
that sounds that sounds really, I do feel like I'm getting fitter, which I guess I'll give myself credit for that. But. I didn't. I didn't get that. I felt that because I was getting tired. Of it. Mm. There we go. Have any of you seen the new? I don't know if you guys spoke about this on a previous episode, but have you guys seen any of the new tech, indoor training tech stuff that's come out? Because that's quite exciting. Uh, like what well, we talked about with Ride, but the elite, about, like the elite new, square the bike blue. has to be. Um, uh, yeah. Have you seen the, the that saw. thing? Looks horrible. That thing is horrible. It looks terrible, but it sounds cool. So I think it's who... one of those things, and, and again, Google the, the Elite Square Smart Frame. Uh, it's it, it's very modern art. Like, you're either going to love it or hate it, right? I do. It's um, like some people will absolutely dig how ugly that thing looks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's kind of cool. Like, I, I I love that it it just works on a trainer, right? Like, you don't. It's not all one piece, like. Uh, a watt bike or a stages bike or whatever so it's it's a you just attach it to any trainer theoretically and then it's got the elite what i can't remember the name of the device but the elite riser thing the thing that pushes the bike up and down it which differentiates it from um the zwift ride so it actually has that piece built into it and then the um it's kind of cool that the digital shifting is built into like real shifters. So instead of just having like Swift play controllers that you push buttons, which some people I guess feel isn't super legit, you like click left and right and you can set it for like Shimano or or SRAM or whatever type of shifting you like to um and and I guess it the um DC Rainmaker review said it was quite clicky, felt pretty legit. So mm. um yeah I I think it, I, I'm jazzed by that. Then the other one, I guess, that came out was uh, the super cheap Jet Black trainer, right? Yeah, so the the Victory, I think they call it, um, which Victory. is, I think it's about $400. Yeah. Um, so, specs... yeah, super cheap. And it, specs are like 2% power accuracy. Um, it's got the Zwift cog on it. The new Zwift cog. cog. Um, so it will work. Pretty much with any, I think, what does it do? Seven to twelve speed bike. Any seven to twelve, to 12 speed bike works with the Zwift cog. Um, the spec, yes. So yeah, super cheap. Um, it's good, isn't it? Like that's two. I mean, opposite ends of the spectrum, but kind of, it's interesting to see with the Zwift ride, like a cheaper option coming out. Like it's interesting to see with this a cheaper option to like get on pre-installed with Zwift and those kind of things. So maybe more people playing the game. But even that elite one, I mean, it's it's pricier than the ride, but it's still if you got that plus a well, this new trainer, or you got a Zwift Core, or the elite. I can't remember Doretto. I can't remember what the cheaper yeah. elite is, but um, you know, it's still cheaper than getting into a uh like a kicker bike or something like that. So you know, they're. I think the the indoor cycling industry has really realized that one of the impediments is the combination that sort of wall to get into the uh, sport or activity, whatever you want to call it, the game, which is you know, like there's a cost element to it, but there's a lot of just sort of intimidation of hooking up a device to a trainer and getting all that done. And the the more they can simplify that, the way more people they're going to get into this thing, so which is good. That's healthy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I pretty much... sorry, you go, Steve. Go for it, Nate. There you go. That's, it's, it's, that was a very British conversation, there, wasn't it? Like, <laughs> you can Brent, go. Brent Alaska's to go now. It's like two Brits and a Canadian is going to be the politest podcast sorry. ever. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting to see different kind of designs coming out. So, if you think about the Zwift bike, that's quite a clean design. The Elite is way out there um, as well. So, kind of, I guess, thinking about how these things look in people's houses and sheds and things like that. And it being something that people want to leave set up and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I think it's, um, it's cool to see the price point coming down. It's cool to see the barriers to entry coming down, isn't it? And more people riding bigger fields on Zwift. Just good, isn't it? So. Yeah. I mean, people yeah. complain about cars. Oh, go ahead. Nate. No, I was just going to say, like, I think um, on that victory, I think there's the news with Zwift- the news with uh, cog as well that you can actually like 
fine adjust like um the chain so yeah. again it's i think it's got like i don't know five or six different settings if not more that you can like line up your ch line up your chain yeah i can tell you as someone who's got his like not quite perfectly lined up because of other issues with my shifter i can i wish i had that because <laughs> i just because you got, move you it. you've got the original right I don't. You know, I mean, I don't think that one's that second one's out yet. I think that's going to be coming out pretty soon, and it's they're going to use it on that trainer. Um, but I'll say again, it's it's quite it's quite interesting how quickly the Zwift's kind of developed the cog. Well, and I think I th think if you ordered the Zwift ride, you're getting the updated Zwift cog too. Are you not? I'm not sure. Yeah, I can't remember. But but, sure either, but. but, but it's interesting to see how quickly they've kind of updated that. Oh, I'm They've sure they got lots. It is it is loud. Like that those little plastic bits around the actual like cog, the teeth, are, like when it just rubs on it, it's louder than just being a little bit out of alignment on a regular cassette. So wow. Do you like the cog though? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I like I said, I just wish my shifter wasn't cooked so I could adjust it a little better, so I could just get it a little cleaner. But other than that. Uh, other than I, i've never had any problems with the click except for that one race and it was it was not just my click honestly like my even my trainer was not feeling very responsive like when i pedal up it was kind of taking an extra like half second or whatever to realize so there was something going on between the because i use the i bridge my companion app because i don't have a bluetooth adapter in the pc i use because i'm too cheap to go buy one when my phone works um mm -hmm. although i may now <laughs> uh but is there something in the transmission of from my trainer to my phone to my because it goes from your trainer to your phone to your Wi-Fi to your PC, right? Because your phone has to be on the same Wi-Fi network as your PC. And there was something yep. in that transmission that was not do being super responsive. And then whatever the problem was with the click was just that I think it was like kind of like delaying, right? Because I'd, I'd click it once and then it would like think that I was clicking it like eight times and go right up the cassette. <laughs> and you're like, oh God. And even at like 4%, like it gets on gear 24, like it's pretty much stop pedaling. And then you'd, so you'd push down like three, four times and then we go right down to zero. <laughs> you have no resistance. And you're like, ah. So like I said, I've never had any problem with it until that one race. And I like it, like I, I get the like kind of complaints about like, it doesn't feel like shifting that much, but. I don't know. I like the digital shifting. I like not feeling like I'm wearing out my bike parts being on my electronic bike. I mean, I that I that to, is a plus. You know, if I, I mean, have to replace a click, it's like going to be twenty or thirty bucks compared to replacing a cassette or a shifter or even a shifter cable. Yeah, last year, I mean, I well well documented it and in, in the Pink Trong chat, but I had to pretty much rebuild my dr drivetrain um, because I was went a bit over the wear level that I should have done and then just wrecked everything. Like um, my, my chain just got wrecked and then it destroyed the drive chain. So m my bottom bracket as well, I just the way I thrash it doesn't survive as long indoors compared to outdoor. Yeah, same, same for me, basically. Like I just, I should have probably, when I first felt that shifter go, I should have taken it in and had it serviced, but you know, you're indoors and you can kind of make it a go of it. And then I take it in and shifters cooked. Now it's a 12 year old part that they don't make anymore. So yeah. I, it's good. I was interested in the, in the shift, uh, well, the Swift cog as well, because I'm struggling and I was struggling with this a year or two ago as well. I've got a gap between two gears that I use a lot in Zwift, so I I'm actually going to sit on my bike maybe tomorrow and just run at eighty RPM and just see what watts I put out in different gears. Um, but there's two gears that kind of in where I am racing quite a lot. If I sit at eighty RPM, it's quite a big watts gap, and I just find I'm constantly like trying to hop in between the two to find that comfortable cadence. Like I feel like I'm dropping too low in cadence to do the lower watts, but then I can't spin fast enough to do the equivalent watts if I, when I change gear. So, so is the Zwift cog kind of? Do you find those step more evenly then when you're when you're using it? You don't. I, I've definitely got like a a dead zone uh, between two two cogs on my bike. Yeah, I've I've found it sufficiently close together. Like I haven't 
really found myself in between too often. There's maybe a few times at certain speeds that you feel like you're not quite as comfortable, but not for the most part. And I got to say, like, I've really gotten used to like seeing the gear right up on the screen and knowing. So now I kind of like, like I know way faster if I'm in the right gear for where we're like, I know if I'm in a flat group with the bees, I got to be in 15 because that's where my 85 RPM is going to be. So, you know, you get, get a lot more used to where that, is and looking at it and relying on it which maybe is not healthy for outdoor riding eventually when you're just going to do it by feel but you kind of like it now now is it is it universal setup in terms of all the gears are the same or is there like a digital cassette you can choose you can monkey with it i have not i just have gone with the default stuff but you can monkey with it to like extend the top end re reduce the bottom end i mean i haven't I have even on like descents on the Alp and stuff. I don't think I've had it all the way up to 24 for any particular length of time. Yeah. And on climbs, even on like the grade and stuff, I don't know if I, I can't remember if I've done a Bologna on it, but on the grade, I'm not even all the way down to one. Like I'm usually in about seven or eight. So, okay. You know, you don't, I, I haven't, I haven't used all 24 yet, really. I mean, I've been in them, but like in terms of actually functionally using them, I haven't needed them. So, yeah. But yeah, it's, I don't know. I, I, I've, like I said, I like, I just like the feeling of not wearing out extra parts on my bike riding indoors. Like it feels more useful to me. I'm waiting for you to fit it with a, a rubber drive train then or something like that. Rent to me. Well, wasn't that the, wasn't that the um that elite thing you talked about? Isn't it doesn't it have a belt drive? I think I that elite I think that elite that. square bike had a belt drive. Cause that was one of the one of the feedback complaints or whatever you want to call it, not a complaint, but a a notice that people had put in of why are you putting a chain on on the Zwift ride when it's like just an indoor bike and you can, you can easily put a perfectly silent belt drive on it. And they're like cost and simplicity of maintenance, blah, blah, blah. But I'm pretty sure that elite one had a belt drive on it. Leaping around the tab. I now have got open is the uh, Swift rating app results for chasing yellow. The chap who won the D's is Sapphire. Um, so if you think most of the people in this race are gold or silver, which is level uh, seven or eight, um, with one being the highest. Uh, there's somebody who's a six. Uh, so platinum. That's awesome. what I'm. I'm uh, a sapphire. Somebody who's a nine, who's a bronze. Uh, and then we have uh, that winning, who is uh, who who is a um, yeah, definitely definitely a sapphire. It looks like though he's uh, he's just done progressive ride so he's gone from gold straight to platinum and then jumped uh in two races from mid platinum the next race to amethyst and then to mid sapphire um so it's just that 90 day uh score note was talking about but it just shows you kind of there's there's somebody in the category that is uh way out of category uh, as it starts so um yeah That's roll on swift racing or or some scores like that that can just use workouts and things and, and go, right, this space on your power and we'll we'll put you in a sensible category. But I suppose if it does it by 90 days, we can all go off the bike for 90 days and then come back, can't we? So. Well, and they, they only open the window in um, in chasing to recat so often, I think, right, to try and keep people together. So you can get quite high up your cat before. Yeah, our gaps aren't that big. We have two threes and fours. So we have one emerald or one ruby, and then em uh, emeralds and sapphires. And I'm a, I'm right on I'm right on the threshold between emerald and sapphire at like a sixteen forty some. And mine's been like almost dead steady since I started chasing. Like I dropped in the first race, and then I've just been like right on that line every time since. So I, I'm beating the same guys and losing the same guys pretty much every race or right on their wheel. So, so just going back to the square bike, you, Brent, you are right. It's a, it's a belt drive, but have you seen the price for it? 
uh oh is is the price out i don't remember i remember it's not cheap but 850. yeah it's not crazy crazy I mean, because what what what's this with right with the like 600 thirteen hundred? oh with a trainer yeah but i think they're figuring when the, just the bike comes out it'll be 600 But I mean, eight fifty for that. I mean, it's Well, like it's I said, not. even if you put a five hundred dollar trainer on it, you're looking at, you know, thirteen fifty for the setup compared to what's a kicker bike like in U.S. Two like two and Tuba, a half. yeah. So, but I I don't know how the belt drive just I don't know how that I would do that. I think that would be an off putter for me just not having that feeling of a supposedly chain. that's why Zwift. I uh, was tuning into the Zwift cast earlier. Supposedly that's why Zwift went with a chain on the Zwift bike, um, so you could fit it to another trainer. Um, it'd be a bit more. easy to set up and that's it But I think you just lose that realism of having that belt drive. I mean, again, because you're still, even with the click, you've still got a chain or the Zwift cogs. So you've still got that kind of the feeling and there's still the, I mean, until I, tr until I try it, I just don't what know how could the be belt, the hottest the, of hot takes I think belt drives are going to be the way the bikes go I think um I think internal hub gearing's going to get better and better again and just the maintenance is so so easy I, I think a lot you see you've seen a few e-bikes go that way a few commuter bikes so it it, it could be the way where the bike the bikes go um we'll see how cold or hot to take that is in the coming years I guess Would it would it work better with the e like as electronic shifting gets easier and easier too on that internal hub gearing? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, yeah, I can see that then for sure because I think I I mean obviously there's still a lot of um, uh, mechanical shifting out there, but that electronic shifting is getting more and more ubiquitous further down the you know now there's Ultegra Ultra you know electronic shifting like it won't be very long before there's 105s that are electronic. And there always is 105 DI2. Yeah, it's Oh, is there? There you go. yeah. um I'm not so convinced on that. Um, I don't, that this this is where I am an old man vinyl listener. That I I would still stick with mechanical shifting. Um, but yeah, um, see where it goes. I, I think I, on mechanical shift, and I'd be one of those that forget to charge it up and be uh, stuck out on a ride uh, with my gears stuck. Yeah, that's exactly where I am <laughs> as well. So. Uh, Yeah, Y'all have never broken a shifter cable on a ride then. I've got I've got a friend who who takes four or five spare cuts of shifter cable with him for exactly that reason, which uh, I just think that's brilliant, isn't it? So. Good. Well, let's maybe end it there saying let's hope all your weekend rides involve no mechanicals, no Zwift mechanicals, everything goes smoothly and the sun shines and there's a tailwind in both directions. <laughs> and we will say thank you to Nate Holm. Thank you to Steve Pritchard. Thank you to everybody who's listening. Thank you to everyone doing the herd races. Enjoy your racing this weekend, everybody. Moo and good night. Good night.